Hey you guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. So I'm doing another reaction to YouTubers. So on my channel, I don't think I have uploaded anything about it. So I don't think you guys know that I'm actually fascinated into crime stories or like those criminal, nasty, scary stuff. How do I say it? It's very interesting and it's not to praise for their criminal acts or anything. I really am totally against it, but these, uh, there's a lot of mystery in behind these each and every murders and their criminal act and especially psychology, psychology, psychological mindset behind each and their, each and every criminal's act. So, Here's a YouTuber named Bailey Sarian. I love her. I love her personality. You'll really, really like her. You'll really like how raw she is and that uh, her sarcastic jokes and all that. Her main channel is basically makeup. So she has the get ready with me and like the kind of uh, theme looks that she could do. And she has a videos about um, her explaining murders and mysteries. She posted on Monday because she called it Murder Mystery Makeup Monday. She posted one about Ted Bundy. Everybody knows about Ted Bundy. I'm pretty sure you guys know what he did back in those days. Uh, you guys could watch his stuff on Netflix and stuff, but um, I just like listening to people explain, tell it their way. So let's just watch her get ready as she explained, talks about Ted Bundy. Let's get it. How are you guys today? My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's Murder, Mystery, and Makeup Monday. I like that theme song. song. If you're new, I'm not allowed to change it or they will come after me. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't want to change it. Hi, if you're new, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing great. Every Monday I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my noggin. And I do my makeup at the same time. She actually looks really, really cute without makeup. This week I thought I would do a very highly requested video, which is on, you probably saw the title and the thumbnail. Today we're going to be talking about Ted Bundy. Like I had mentioned in the Jeffrey Dahmer video I had done, which I will link down below if you haven't seen it, <laughs> I get requested to do these two people the most. Jeffrey Dahmer, which we did, and Ted Bundy. Always. And I for bet. a long time, since the beginning I started this whole series, I've been putting off doing both of them because I just felt like, what can I add to the story? Like, everything has literally been said. They're the most notorious uh, criminal. Every movies every documentary series and uh books and interviews has all been out there so we've all seen pretty much everything i don't think there's anything new like she says what else can i add what else would you hear that is new i just i overthink everything that's why i've just been putting it off because i was like what can i add nothing it's all been said but i have to give the people what they want and they've been asking for mr bundy so, <laughs> i just have to mention that ted bundy i mean there are tons of tv shows tv series docuseries movies books so many articles like i said earlier and movies and content out there about ted bundy and the whole story so i am just going to keep it kind of simple i guess or more just straight to the point like what he did and that stuff okay yes just kind of like boom 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 i tried to lay this out in a way that made sense ted, i do it too ted 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 so let's start off with his early years ted's early years <laughs> wow okay. suddenly on the continent. louise cowell who went by louise was 22 years old and unmarried when she gave birth to her son theodore Bundy. And Ted was born on November 24th, 1946. So he's a Sag. <laughs> so Louise delivered Ted at a home for unwed mothers in Vermont and later brought her new son to her parents' home in Philadelphia. Now, Ted's father may have been a man named Lloyd Marshall, who was an Air Force veteran and a Penn State graduate, according to Anne Rule, a co-worker of Ted's. She was also an author of the book The Stranger Beside Me. Other forces had Ted's father named Jack 
Worthington, while some rumors had it that his father was also his grandfather. On Ted's birth certificate, there's a little section where you put who the father is. Father was listed as unknown. His biological father's identity honestly may never be confirmed, but there are just a ton of different rumors rumors. If you guys know Bailey Sarian, she goes all the way from the criminal's history and background. So every video when she's explaining about the criminal, you'll see that. So you can kind of think where they come from or what kind of house environment they were living in. Now Ted's <laughs> mother, her name's Eleanor, like I had mentioned, she was brought up by parents who were very religious and having a baby at 22 years old without a husband, scandalous, you know, like I feel like this is very common in a lot of our stories. It was very frowned upon. You just mm -hmm. didn't do that. Right. And still in some places it is considered still to be scandalous. You just don't do that. Anyways. So to hide the fact that the father was unknown, Ted was raised by his grandparents as an adopted baby. And in his early years, he was led to believe that his mother was instead his sister, which I'm sure was confusing because then as a toddler, Ted and now his mother moved to Tacoma, Washington. It's like one minute that's your sister, the next minute it's like, oh, that's my mom now. Confusing for the poor child. In 1951, Ted's mother, Louise, she would marry a man named Johnny Bundy and that's how Ted got the last name Bundy. So Ted took his stepfather's last name, but it's said that their relationship was not very good. Ted resented his stepfather for being uneducated and working class, lower to working class, like he wasn't making money. But he just didn't like that. Mm -hmm. But Louise and Johnny would go on to have several children together and just be a little happy family. Now it was said at a young age, Ted was displaying odd fascinations with death, murder, morbid, and Topic. Like, I wonder how like mothers would feel when you see your own child like behaving like, in that way. That at the age of three, he Ted was obsessed with knives. Oh like, my god! Very interested in knives, shiny, sharp. He would be playing with them, or he would like to collect them. And this was odd because, well, he was three. Now, as a student, that would freak Ted me was out. Intelligent and did very well in school, but socially, he had a hard time making friends he uh, struggled so. being social but he was overall like a great student and then when he became a teenager puberty hit and his behavior started to go off the track a little bit there ted on his <laughs> free time would enjoy peeping in people's windows just being a little perv and that's illegal too so don't do that kind of similar <laughs> so don't to do that. the night stalker remember if you watch that yeah. video he did the same thing ted would enroll into the university of washington and while there he met and fell in love with a young lady from california because she had everything that he always wanted and desired Which she was... had class influence and money where he came from a family of lower class no influence and no money but the two did start dating when she decided to end the relationship he was devastated and later it became apparent that many of his victims resembled her long dark hair and attractive ted would go Imparted on to graduate from the university of washington with a degree in psychology in 1972 he had also been accepted to law school in utah but he would never earn his degree. You know, Ted was a pretty smart cookie. In 1969, Ted began a six-year relationship with a woman named Elizabeth, who he met at a bar in Seattle. Elizabeth was a single mother of a young daughter, and she struggled with alcoholism, but Ted said that he took care of her, and she referred to Ted as, quote, warm and loving. By the mid-1970s, Ted had become more outwardly confident and active in social and political matters. Ted even got a letter of recommendation from the Republican governor of Washington after working on his campaign. And yeah, I don't even think, I know, I know that's why people are obsessed with him because he was charismatic, he was handsome. That's pretty much why. I like the way she like said that. so obsessed with him. Like, how could this handsome guy be responsible for all of these murders? I just can't believe it. Well, I wonder I'm why. You, kid cats, you know, a murderer I mean, does not look. I wonder uh, what kind of makeup she's going for in this one. A specific thing, like we think. There are some murderers who definitely fit that idea of murderer in our minds, but there are a lot who don't. Ted is a great example. 
you know how normally I do these videos, I kind of go into like the whole story leading up to what happened and whatnot. Well, there's like, look, there's a lot. So I'm just gonna like jump into the murders part. Around 1974. Around this time, many women in the Seattle area and in nearby Oregon went missing. I mean, a ton of women. Stories circulated about some of the victims last being seen in the company of a young, dark-haired man known as Ted. You know, I don't know why he didn't think to use a fake name. Yeah, this me Ted neither. I always wondered that. Lure his victims into his car by pretending to be injured and asking for their help. And it's sad because their kindness and willingness to help this guy, like, it killed them, which is awful. Okay, I had to put my hair back. So Ted would often go back to the bodies after he killed them and disposed of them. And being the sicko that he is, he would perform sexual acts, sadly, with the corpses. And it's said that he would continue oh, that's a good to idea. I should wipe like that. the bodies were so decomposed or damaged by wild animals that it was no longer possible to have physical contact with them. So at least 12 of Ted's victims were decapitated and some of their heads were believed to be kept in his apartment for, for a small amount of time. And like many serial killers, uh, you know, they keep their trophies, as they call it, something to remember the killing from. But Ted kept the heads as his trophies. It's That's said really that Ted freaky. got a great deal of enjoyment reliving his crimes simply by looking at or touching the severed heads of his victim. So I'm going to read some of his victims that were linked to Ted for sure. I'm not going to mention their names just because I don't have permission to do so, to use their names. So I just don't feel like it's, I should. Plus, I feel like I, I can't give the victim a proper backstory because there's a lot there's a lot so I just think it's best if I leave their names out of it do you get what I'm saying I hope so these victims were for sure linked to Ted let me grab my book my handy dandy book I guess I could just read some right this is just like a timeline okay timeline of known murders February 1st 1974 a 21 year old woman she was bludgeoned while she was sleeping and abducted and abducted sorry i don't mean to sound so happy her skull and her jawbone were discovered at taylor mountain in sonoma county california march 12 1974 a 19 year old woman was also abducted sadly murdered her and then left her body at taylor mountain she was never found but ted claims that he killed her for sure they never found her though so it's like what <sighs> It's a mountain. April 17th, 1974, an 18-year-old disappeared Something while happened. attending a meeting at Central Washington State College. Her skull and her jawbone were found at Taylor Mountain. May 6th, 1974, 22-year-old. She goes missing from Oregon State University, and also her skull was found at Taylor Mountain. June 1st, 1974, we have another 22-year-old. Now, she disappeared after leaving, it seems to be like a bar. Um, her skull also found at Taylor Mountain. That Ted guy really likes Taylor Mountain. July 14th, 1974, 23-year-old. She was abducted from Lake Sammamish. Sammamish? Sammamish? Oh, Jesus, baby. Oh. <laughs> some days it goes really smoothly, and it, some days, like today, I'm struggling. Well, she's doing one hand with makeup and the other trying to hold the book. In the fall of 1974, Ted moved to Utah to attend law school. While there, coincidentally, women just began disappearing. I mean, he was doing work. And I don't mean to be funny at all, but it's just kind of crazy how many victims he had. Like, how did he find the time? So Utah, Colorado, and Idaho, there were nine victims that were linked to Ted. And then in Florida, there were three. And as far as possible victims go, there were a ton. A lot of the women that were linked to Ted was because Ted came forward, well, talked to detectives when he was in prison and told them you know who they were and where they were at a lot of them just weren't found and if they think they found them it would just be bits and pieces of their remains but not enough to actually link them or identify them so it's like they were just trusting his word which is like why would they why i don't know i guess they have to trust the the killer i mean they have no one else to trust in that situation so sure. in 1974 elizabeth remember the lady that ted was dating at the time now she started to suspect that ted was just up to no good she's got that feeling we all get it that intuition something is not right 
Huh. Elizabeth <laughs> kind of, you know, would snoop around and question things like, where did this come from? I don't remember him having this. Mm-hmm. She even went through his desk and he had a meat cleaver in his desk. And she would ask him, like, why do you have a meat cleaver in your desk? Yeah. Ted, he used his charm to deflect. Deflect, deflect, deflect. He just reassured her everything's fine, everything's good. Meat cleaver. <laughs> if a guy were to say that and like tries to use his charms, that would be still stuck in my head throughout the whole time. I'd be like, okay, well, at that time he said this, so, but he, and we ended it in that sort of way, but why is it in your desk? <laughs> kind of thing. It, it would just linger in my head throughout the whole day. When you think about it, because a lot of the times, like, oh, I couldn't imagine if you were, let's just say, side note, let's just say you're married to a killer. Oh, that would fucking suck. I like, would. Like, when you really think about it, like, what it, you know how sometimes when you read about a killer or watching a whatever about a killer and they're married and you're like, how did you not know that he was doing something like that? Like, naturally, we want to question them. Like, how did you really Everybody know? questions. What if you really didn't know? And then all this comes out in the news and everyone's judging you. Like, yeah, bitch, sure, you didn't know. Like, that sucks. Yeah, that Someone you suck. love, someone you cared about, you spent all these years with is a killer. I believe that she really, she didn't know what was going on. She had that deep down feeling. She thought some things he was doing was really suspicious. But for the most part, she, I don't think she knew that he was, I don't think she actually knew what he was doing. Married to a killer. That sucks. She would end up going to police with her suspicion of Ted's involvement in the local murders, but they didn't believe her that he was indeed the killer. And the two of them would end up remaining together, but they did grow pretty distant when Ted moved to Olympia the following year. And then in 1975, Elizabeth went to police again, this time with evidence that helped them to arrest Ted. Now, I guess Ted had called Elizabeth up and he had confessed to her over the <laughs> phone from his prison cell that he had tried to kill her and couldn't resist his impulses when he felt, quote, his sickness building in him. She broke ties with Ted for good and she ended up writing a book about it, about her experience with Ted, and it was titled The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy. Caught. Okay, so let's talk about how he got caught. So on August 16th, 1975, Ted failed to stop at a routine traffic stop and was caught and arrested by the Utah Highway Patrol officer in Salt Lake City. So Good job. police officer <laughs> pulls Ted over, not knowing who is in the car. And he comes up to the car and he's looking at the passenger seat and he notices that oh. the passenger seat is missing. Okay, like why is your passenger seat missing? Who has a missing seat? <sighs> officer asks Ted to step out of the vehicle. And while the officer is searching uh, Ted's car, that's when he comes across what he called a, quote, murder kit, end quote. A murder kit. The items found included a mask made from pantyhose, a ski mask, handcuffs, rope, an ice pick, a crowbar, and a trash bag, as well as, well, trash bags, let me correct myself, the <laughs> trash bags, as well as a number of tools. Well, like, you know, the ice pick, hammer, tools. Mm-hmm. So the police officer's like, if this doesn't scream, I'm doing something bad, then I don't know what does, you know? Like, this is the biggest red flag I've ever seen in my life. Thank God this officer didn't let him go, like most officers in previous stories may have to hey, buddy. I know you're not playing a game of Clue, okay? This is real life. What is all this? So he's telling the officer, like, yeah, I'm just taking this stuff back to my apartment. Like, it's not a big deal. I mean, don't you have a homemade mask at a pantyhose, officer? Oh, my God. But luckily, this police officer remembered the description of the car and suspect from a kidnapping in November of the previous year. It matched Ted, exactly. Good thinking officer, you know? So the officer tells Ted, yeah, I, I, you're under arrest, and arrests him. And after Ted was arrested, his apartment was then searched. But oddly enough, when they searched his apartment, they didn't find anything at that time. I don't know where a lot of it was, but it wasn't there at his apartment. Because they didn't find anything, Ted was released and put on a 24-hour surveillance. I mean, if 
we exclude what we know now, at the time it was like, we don't have anything on this guy. They can't hold him without any evidence, you know? They were doing what they had to. So during this period, detectives would then interview his previous girlfriend, Elizabeth, remember? And she was up in Seattle. She said that before Ted had moved to Utah, she came across some very odd items in her apartment, but also at Ted's home. And they were like, go on, because we couldn't find shit. She said that she found a bag of white, dry, mixed plaster of Paris, crutches, surgical gloves, a sack of women's clothing, and a meat cleaver. So she's telling detectives all this. Yeah, well, I'm sure she didn't say that. She's asked him, though, like, where did you get this? He warned her and said, quote, if you tell anyone, I'll break your fucking neck, end quote. So she's like... All right, you know, like, shit. She also said that Ted would become very upset whenever she considered cutting her hair. And her hair, it was very long, brown, and it was parted down the middle, just how Ted liked it. And a lot of his victims had longer hair. At that time, Ted was driving a Volkswagen Beetle. When he got arrested, they had to, you know, they went through his apartment and stuff, and they also needed to retrieve his Volkswagen Beetle, which... Ted had sold to just a young teenager, which was like an easy way to get rid of it, you know? So they went and they got the Volkswagen Beetle. And they were quite lucky, actually, because the new owner hadn't done any, like, deep cleaning, and they put it under forensic testing. They found hairs in the vehicle that matched to three different women who, I think two of them were missing, one of them was still alive, and they were able to get the, the victim that was still alive. She was going to press charges, right? Ted was then put in a lineup and he was with some other men and they brought in this victim who had escaped and they asked her to point out is any of these men the one who attempted to kidnap you and she was able to point ted out right away she said that ted pretended to be quote officer roseland end quote and she was certain that ted was the man that took her for some gross reason despite being charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assaults from the victim who got away ted was let out of jail once again on bail awesome usually that goes so great you know i mean how many chances does this guy get i know so ted while he was out he was just kind of doing his own thing but then he was brought back in in february of 1976 for the case of the woman who had escaped and was found guilty he was sentenced to up to 15 years in prison on june 30th only 15 now this is just for the one woman who had escaped this was not for any of the other murders or anything he had done this is just for the one lady but ted had remained in prison only up until october of 1976 because that's when he was able to escape prison oh i forgot to run for it found not long after hiding in some bushes out on the prison grounds and once he was caught he was sent to solitary confinement and he would be in there for several weeks which that will make you definitely lose it that same month that ted was i love her lashes he was charged with the murder of a woman in aspen and he was transferred for the trial and chose to represent himself in court meaning he was excused from being handcuffed or shackled pretty smart huh Mm. so at one point ted had asked to visit the law library which was located in the courthouse so he can conduct research for his case ted noticed once he entered the library that or somebody had left open a window okay so in this room he's in he notices oh the fucking window was open <laughs> when everyone left the room it was just him for a split second he jumped out of the second story window and escaped he would end up being recaptured but it wasn't until eight days later this wasn't the last time he would attempt to escape either he kept escaping yeah okay? and then there was another what are they doing uh shouldn't you like had more security guards like shouldn't you have done like anything to change and like really really guard this man like in december ted would escape from custody again he climbed out of a hole he made in the ceiling of his cell now he was dedicated i guess he he really had nothing else to do but he dropped more than 30 pounds so he could fit through the small opening he had made i heard that he climbed through the ceiling hole he then dropped down into the chief jailer's apartment who luckily he just seems to be full of luck this guy but he this man just happened to be out for the night so ted drops into the apartment and stole his clothes and then just walks out the front door (laughs) 
I'm laughing because it's just so stupid. Yeah, I can't <laughs> she always so says that. Smart. Or everybody's just dumb. Ted was missing for 15 hours, which gave him a big head start. Holy shit, that's a long time, 15 hours. It just now clicked. When you really think about it, that's a full day. They thought he was sleeping in his bed. He made his way into Florida State University sorority house. And at around 2.45 a.m., he attacked a 21-year-old woman with a piece of firewood as she was sleeping in her bed. He then used a nylon stocking to strangle her. And then when she passed, he moved on and he went to another sleeping 20-year-old woman's room and Ted beat her until she was unconscious then strangled her. With this victim he tore off um, one of her nipples and then bit her her butt, her buttocks and assaulted buttocks. her sexually with a bottle. The bite mark left on this victim would would actually I don't want to say it was a good thing but in a way good thing because it would later prove Ted's connection to these murders in the first place. The DNA. He left a mark and they were able to prove that these were Ted's teeth later on in court. He went into the bedroom next door and Ted attacked the two women who were asleep in there. One of the women had her jaw broken and her shoulder was like almost cut off and the other woman received a concussion, a broken jaw, a broken finger and some of her teeth were knocked out. All four women were attacked within 15 minutes so it was really quick wow really quick. rage After fleeing from the sorority house ted broke into an apartment and attacked another woman student from the university she God suffered damn. a dislocated shoulder a broken jaw her skull was fractured in five places and she was left permanently deaf she luckily survived a 12 year old girl and then fled these crimes marked the end of his murderous rampage because once again, Ted was pulled over by a police officer on February 15th. When they ran the plates, they saw that this vehicle was marked as stolen. So when the officer came back to Ted and informed him that he was under arrest, Ted flipped. He's like, I don't want to go back to jail. He kicks him and then he runs off. The police officer fired two warning shots. Rare. <laughs> yeah, very rare. He caught up to Ted and he tackled him. They struggled, they fought, but luckily this officer was able to get Ted under arrest. Thank God, finally, you know? Well, I mean, how many chances did this guy get? He got too many chances. Yeah. And inside the vehicle, they see three sets of IDs belonging to women from the Florida State University. It was the woman that he just attacked. They also found 21 stolen credit cards and a stolen television set. <laughs> Like, where is he going with that? Like, where are you going? You know. Why take the TV at that point? You Maybe know, he was like, desperate. You're not, okay. While in prison in February of 1980, there was a woman named Carol Ann Boone. She was a mother of two. Ted and Carol, they both had dated before his initial arrest. And in the courtroom during the penalty phase of his trial, he proposed and she accepted in the presence of the judge, making the marriage legitimate in Florida. So the is it like is it the woman who's like really really obsessed with Ted Buddy? I remember there was a woman who's like completely fell in love with Ted Buddy and kept sending him love letters and like at telling him like she wants to marry him and stuff like that, and he really liked that because he got the attention. Two of them got married. The couple had met six years earlier when they both worked at the Department of Emergency Services, and then Carol gave birth to um, a daughter. Her name was Rose in 1980. Two, and Ted was listed as the father of this baby. Not much is known about Rose today. Honestly, I mean, like, just leave it alone. Eventually, eventually, it took her some time, but she realized that Ted actually was guilty of all these crimes. She's like, oh my god, you really did do it, you sicko. And then she ended up divorcing him three years prior to his execution, according to her book. Her book is called A Stranger Beside Me. She stopped visiting Ted during the last two years of his imprisonment. And then in June of 1979, Ted would stand trial for the homicides and assaults that had taken place at the sorority house. It was covered by 250 reporters from five continents and was the first to be televised nationally in the U.S. I know because we needed that. On February 10th, 1980, Ted was sentenced to death by electrocution. As the sentence was announced, he reportedly stood up and shouted, quote, tell the jury they were wrong, end quote. Now, he was sentenced to death, but it wouldn't be carried out until nine years 
years later. And it was believed that Ted would come forward with new information about other victims as a way to push back his execution date further and further. He was just buying himself more time. They can't kill this guy when he has all this information. Ted would eventually be put in the electric chair on January 24th, 1989. He God was 42 damn. years old. Now, many people celebrated when it was announced Ted was dead. People sang, danced, and set off fireworks across the street from the prison as the execution was carried out. Then they cheered loudly as the hearse like drove off from the prison to carry Ted to wherever he was going. People are cheering, holding up their little woos, you know. His body was cremated in Gainesville and his ashes were said to be scattered at an undisclosed location in Washington State. Conversation in 1987, he confided in the county detective that there were some murders he would never ever talk about because they were quote too close to home, too close to family, or involved quote victims who were very young. In 2011, Ted's DNA profile was added to the FBI's database for future reference in hopes to close other unsolved murder cases. And that, my friends, is just a little snippet about Ted Bundy. He was very awful. He was really gross. Unfortunately, we'll just probably never get closure as far as how many victims he had, how many there were, where they are. Like, that sucks. That fucking sucks. He has a lot of fans. He has a lot of fans. Just like with um, the Night Stalker Mm -hmm. and Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm -hmm. Lots of fans. You know what's kind of interesting to me? Ted Bundy and the Night Stalker, they had very similar stories. They liked the attention, they liked the media, and I think they just overall enjoyed the spotlight, right? If you haven't seen, I did do a video on the Night Stalker. If you're curious, I'll link that down below. But they kind of have a lot of similarities. Anyways, I They also look a little similar, don't you think? hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful day today. You make good choices. Please, please, please be safe out there. I would say be careful. Like, don't talk to strangers. But I feel like a lot of his victims were just trying to, like, be nice and Mm -hmm. and just help him. You know, which is so sad. Because it's like, I don't want to say don't be nice to people. Listen to your intuition. I I don't know. Oh, shit. (laughs) Anyway, let me know your thoughts down below. I hope you have a wonderful day today. I already said all this, didn't I? Please be safe out there. And (laughs) I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye. Bye. I love her makeup. <laughs> I really, really like it. I've been looking at those lashes for a long time. I'm gonna like this video. Okay, there you have it. That was Bailey Sarian and her explaining Ted Bundy's uh, mystery case um, or the murder case. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed her personality. Very, very fun personality. Also sarcastic. Some people are not used to her way of sarcasm, but I think it's like. It's really fun to watch sometimes to me. She also have vlo- some vlogs, so if you guys are very interested in her, you guys are you guys should check them out. They're really interesting. She has lots and lots of vi- uh, makeup videos. If you're really interested, you guys should check it out. She does really really good makeup tutorials. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. I'll see you next time. Hopefully, not a YouTuber. Bye.